Hi everyone, hope uh, there will be a plenty of us, um, of attendees. So I'm going to talk about the, as you know, the, um, the use, the work we have been doing for the emergency disaster response um, following the Tonga eruption. Uh, of course, I will cover also the scientific side of um, these activities, but I also want to talk more in general about why BGS and Comet got involved in this event. Um, um, and there are another, let's say, warning is there is still a lot of work going on. So um, I'm going just to present a minimum part of the overall um, results we got so far. Um, and as you can see, uh, Oh, sorry, I'm just trying uh, to move. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to move to the next slide. Okay. Um, so this is just Tamara gave a hint already of the organizational structure. So on the top of this slide, you see essentially um, the structure where, where BGS and Comet sits. So essentially we are part of BASE, um, which is the department, the UK department of business energy industrial strategy. They essentially provide funding to lots of agency to tackle issues like climate change, um, uh, promote underpin innovation. One of these, um, is UK RIME. So UK Research and Innovation is a non-departmental public body which essentially direct research and innovation funding uh, from for base towards different institutes, including the BGS. So essentially it provides us the tool uh, to do the money, to do our research. And as Tamara was saying, since 2019, 2021, over the last two, three years, um, the collaboration between BGS and Comet became even stronger. Um, and uh, essentially, this means that we now work together to deliver national capability in Earth observation to understand different type of process. Um, but no, of course, um, um, for Comet is mainly tectonic and volcanic um, ones. Um, and uh, among these national capabilities duties, of course, there is also activity associated to disaster response. So we provide BGS along with Comet all together, geoscience data information to support, for example, policy development, decision-making process. So it's not just about uh, science for a res mainly or only scientific purpose, but also for real impact on real life. So, for, and we now go, I want to bring you now to the bottom part of this slide. So what happened during a volcano emergency? I tried to summarize. Essentially, there are different body who activates, um, depending of course, of also mainly of where happened this disaster. Um, for example, we have uh, the cabinet office, the FCD, also the Foreigners Commonwealth Office. Uh, why uh, they are, uh, let's say interested, even if on in uh, mainland uh, UK territory there are no active volcanoes, is essentially because these bodies are interested to protect national interest of the UK, uh, protecting British citizens so all over the world. So you will know FCDO, you probably came across their website every time you, you look for travel advice. Okay, so it's important essentially um, in order to ensure uh, to promote well being of UK citizens uh, in the UK and abroad. Of course, that we uh, they manage also uh, natural disaster. Uh, because, for example, you probably remember for the older people um, the eruption in Iceland in 2010, there was a huge impact on UK uh, in terms of travel roads. So a lot of flights were cancelled. Um, and of course, these bodies, these government bodies, uh, they need support from science institutions. So you will see here, I put some, but they are not exhaustive. Um, 
uh, logos about some of the main or usual uh, actors when it's about volcano emergency response. So we have high uh, university in Manchester, but not only Manchester, the Met Office, BGS and Comet, uh, but also um, some other uh, institution. One is the Volcanic Hash Advisory Center for which BGS is providing scientific expertise. So essentially, um, it's a group of this back, it's a group of experts responsible for coordinating and disseminating information on the atmospheric volcanic ash clouds that might endanger aviation. And then we have also uh, the charter, the international charter space for major, major disaster. Essentially, it's a worldwide collaboration through which satellite data are made available for uh, support disaster management activities. So, um, and these are essentially for the Tonga erup eruption, the main, um, let's say, yeah, actor who uh, were involved. But this, of course, this is probably, uh, as I mentioned beginning, uh, I want to bring also the bigger picture why BGS and Comet suddenly are interested in an event that happened more than 10,000 miles away from here. Uh, because as I say, it's key for the government to protect, uh, safeguard British citizens also abroad. Um, so we have every two years usually, um, the government along with scientists compile what is the national risk register. So it's an assessment of the likelihood and impact of a range of different national security risks. So there are from cyber attacks to uh, more environmental hazard, um, any type of accident, and essentially uh, provide not just um, information about the impact and likelihood, but also a sort of guidelines on how uh, the government, but also local authorities, and different body has to or, um, have to uh, respond to this emergency, uh, and this also uh, is uh, these guidelines are uh, provide also guidelines for members of the public. Okay, and you could see essentially um, that the Tonga event uh, as a mix of uh, is a mix of other because we have both a volcanic eruption number twenty here, but also uh, cover this number 23 environmental disaster overseas. Um, so, um, so this is why the government is interested. This is why BGS and Comet are interested because essentially it's part of our BGS strategy to address global challenges, including volcanic hazard. Um, in the short term, is also an opportunity to investigate understanding how this disaster these hazardous processes affect people and property so tamara was saying at the beginning as a bgs we are focusing a lot on the impact not just the sign the study of the other itself also the impact on people and properties um uh, it also support for example uh, as a part of the bgs strategy and more broadly the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So it means that our work, our involvement uh, might contribute to um, essential improvement, uh, improve the quality of life, um, develop a sustainable society, which can better respond to this type of event. And as I say, as I highlighted here in red, uh, we also directly informed the UK government uh, about travel advice, but also relocating tourists and residents. So you could see some of these uh, bulletin on the FCDO uh, few days after the main eruption in Tonga, which of course is also based on the scientific evidence and uh, we provide them. So this is just to give a bit of context. Where are we? Um, so it's a uh, this Unga Tonga Unga Pai volcano is in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific. So um, it's one of the main, main volcanoes in the Tonga Kermadec volcanic arc. Um, and uh, you could see 
um, the island, sorry, I'm just trying, um, essentially the islands and reef, you can see here, bathymetric map um, uh, of the, the whole heart system. So all these islands, they are packed together. They are uh, the only surface features uh, visible of a much larger submerged volcano. Uh, he has uh, already has been active during the Holocene with the most recent event in 2014-2015. Um, and if I move to this, um, this is just a zoom of the previous line. We have to consider this again is bathymetric water depth measurements. Um, we could see um, essentially this is a bathymetric survey of 2015. So. Uh, soon after the previous eruption cycle, uh, it showed the summit of the edifice. So you could see if, um, essentially these two islands, which name essentially give the name to uh, the volcano, uh, were isolated before 2014. Uh, they then merged as a result of the 2014-2015 activity. But you could see they are part of the hedge, they border a caldera, which lies between 150, 180 meters below the sea surface. Um, and you have to consider that this cone, um, as you can read from the last bullet point, um, the eruptions, the 2014-15 eruption cycle built up land for a total elevation of more than 100 meters. Now we start to see some satellite imagery. Um, this is um, essentially just a GIF here to show uh, the islands between the last two activities uh, cycles, so between 2015 and 2022, um, just to show that essentially you could see, um, especially in the North Shore, this island, like also Krakatau, um, this active island, the essentially undergoes a lot of changes. Um, so in less than three weeks during 2014-15, we have more than 120 meters of land uh, erected. But after 2015, and you can see from this, especially on the Northern shore, the island has shrunk for more than 500 meters. Um, so th there is a continuous uh, battle between building new land and eroding new. Uh, new lands. Um, and now I'm getting close to the January, December, January 2022. Uh, this is just to give you the timeline of the events and uh, also to understand essentially, uh, give a better idea of how fast we can respond and how useful can be our information uh, as a scientist. Um, so the 20th of December, so according to the Volcanic Hush Advisory Center in Wellington, we start to have the first sign of a renewed activity. So we, we experience, we see the first blooms. Uh, from this moment, so I start to put essentially, this is traffic light code. I just use it, I made by myself. So it's nothing official, nothing is official here. It's just to give an idea of the severity of the event. Uh, from the 20th of December, uh, the Tonga Geological Service started to publish uh, daily some bulletin to mainly to inform local residents on what to do um, and uh, any uh, essentially precaution to take. Uh, between 20th of December and 3rd of January, we have a quite intense source and explosive activity. Uh, we could also see, for example, for most of these are a, co a collection of Sentinel-2 images, so optical satellite data. Uh, most of the time, we cannot see the island itself. It's covered by the plume. Um, and we also have uh, plenty of uh, pumice raft surrounding the islands. Um, the 3rd of January, we have a slightly decreasing activity of 
um, of uh, of the plum. So we can literally start to see the island again. And it's important, this is also to highlight how essentially uh, during these weeks and until the main eruption, essentially satellite data were a key uh, source, the only source of information. Um, um, then we have, and this is an example, so, oh, uh, this is an example of it's uh, here of the bulletin from the Tonga Geological Survey. Um, so, uh, which was daily dispatched until the um, the fifteenth of January. So, uh, the day before, the fourteenth, um, we have essentially between uh, the twentieth and the third, we have. A huge activity, then a relatively quiet period for the next 11 days. On the 14th, we have a ex renewed explosive eruption. Um, and um, this 14th uh, explosion uh, activity essentially destroyed the connection between the two islands, Hunga Tonga and Hunga Pai. Um, and um, this also led the Tonga Meteorological Service to issue the first tsunami warning um, on that day. But the main, essentially, explosion, the one we saw all over the internet from um, all the, also the meteorolo mainly from meteorological uh, satellite data, happened on the 15th, so it's around 4 a.m. Uh, UTC time, which was, I think, uh, around five in the afternoon in Tonga. This is also a key moment because soon after we have, uh, you know, you probably heard the internet cable um, was broken, uh, which means there was no um, direct source of information from the islands anymore. Um, and also we, in addition to this, we, of course, we even don't have any more any bulletin from the Tonga Geological Survey. A uh, few hours, I think, um, I have this information later, I, wrote, I think a few hours after, so still in the 15th of January, we have the activation of the disaster charter. And I will go a little bit in details later on how it works. Um, and you can see this is the, oh, sorry, the, um, the first radar image after the main explosion, the 15, where you could see the two islands are now disconnected again. Uh, and then, of course, the 16 started, it was quite quick, to be honest. The 16th of January, uh, despite being in the middle of a renewed peak of pandemic, um, but the day after, we, we have already the first survey from New Zealand uh, military uh, body. Um, and then we also have the FCDO requesting BGS and Met Office for advice um, on essentially mm, um, next step to uh, and to um, to take. Uh, what type, for example, of um, information provide to travel uh, people traveling abroad? I don't know if you remember, but essentially the first person to die uh, was a Britons living there um resident there um this is um so um these images to show essentially the area affected uh so you have to consider that the plume we saw in the previous slide so this plume here captured by um i think it's one of the nasa satellite meteorological satellite is a radius between 160 to 190 kilometers, so well above, okay, uh, beyond this radius. But this is where essentially most of the inhabitants, Tonga residents live. Um, so you see in, within this area um, lives more than 80,000 people. Uh, in particular, 10 of these, there are hundreds okay we've uh, as a disaster charter we focused on 13 islands but 10 of these 
uh, have a permanent settlements, but in terms of there are more than probably hundreds of highlands within these 100 kilometers. And of course, consider that we are not doing, when we uh, take part to a disaster charter initiative, we don't care about the science. The main things is saving life, essentially supporting um, the response activity. So for us, it's important to understand damage, volcanic activity is still ongoing or not, tsunami impact, because this also the damage is mainly affecting um, first responders, uh, if a road is blocked or not, these type of things. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I will just move. So, um, as I mentioned before, disaster shutter was activated, I think, a few hours after the main explosion on the 15th of January. This disaster charter is an initiative that's dating back in to 2000. Um, so, um, mm. of course, we in, uh, is essentially grouping together space agency and uh, also space operators so that even high expensive and high resolution satellite imagery can be used when release or new task and acquisition can be acquired. Uh, in specific area of the world, you have to consider that over 20 years, uh, it has been operating in more than 120 nations. Tonga, you can read here, this is if you go on the website, there are all the information, all the data are freely available to everyone, all the interpreted results, not the raw satellite data. So you could see, um, this is UTC time, so 12, 4 UTC was the main explosion, 12 hours later, there was the activation. There are just specific members who are registered to the charter who can activate um, the request of data. Uh, BGS is one of them. You can see here, this is the, the 744th activation over these 20 years, of course. Um, in the first full year of operation, in 20, 2001, there were only 11 activation. Over 2021, there were 48, so more than four times the number of activation. This is not because that we have more uh, disaster, uh, hazardous events, it's mainly because we have more satellite data. As simple as this. Um, and uh, in specifically, we have been working with people from UN, in total, there were uh, six members, including BGS, uh, working for a period of three weeks, analyzing um, satellite data. Total of almost 500 data were collected and tasked. Um, as, I, um, as I mentioned before, the main interest was damage map, and the results are quickly uh, available to everyone on the website. Um, among the members, uh, we have also, um, of course, we is the disaster charter is not the only um, international initiative which use satellite data uh, to support disaster response. We have also the Copernicus Emergency Service, but that is based only on Sentinel, essential Copernicus um, data. Um, in this case. Um, the one of these project member was coordinating the activity with project manager was UNITA, so the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. They were uh, essentially coordinating the activity and they were asking to each of the other members what to do, essentially. Um, as I say, there is also the Copernicus Emergency Service. There is also RIA. Arian, sorry, which is a collaboration uh, between JPL, Caltech to exploit again radar and optical remote sensing data. Um, so there are, and there is also SEALS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellite. Again, is another um, effort to essentially um, make sure that satellite data can provide societal benefit. Um, but um, I have to say that compared to all these other 
initiative, Disaster Charter has a main priority, which is the emergency response itself. Um, this is how it looks like. Essentially, once you are a registered member, you start working on the data, you have a dashboard where you can uh, visualize all the data. Um, and there are also new tools upcoming to who will allow to, uh, until a few years ago, you have to essentially, this tool, uh, the dashboard was only allowing you to visualize and downloading the data. But uh, I will show you the interface of the new um, um, dashboard, which allow also to process the data on the fly. Um, so, um, and among this product, you could see here, um, uh, the main, let's say, benefit of being part of the disaster charter is the amount of high resolution satellite data um, that can be uh, obtained and be acquired in a, in a matter of a few days. Um, this is the new uh, dashboard, which essentially um, allows any registry user to process the data automatically on the fly. Um, I'm just going to move forward. So for the disaster charter, we could see we focus on a tiny area. Um, I mentioned the plume is much, uh, much larger than this 150 kilometer radius, but this is where people live. So this is the main interest. Of those 500 uh, satellite data, uh, 150 were high resolution to very high resolution data sets. We are talking about resolution of one meter and not better. So play this word view. Uh, the area covered, it's around 40,000 square kilometer from unless all these, these are the footprint of all the data available. But as I say, most of the islands were essentially, uh, I mean, there is no permanent human settlement there. So in the end, it was just a tiny area to be covered. And we look at different type of information. Of course, some of them have priority. Uh, the damage was the, the main priority. Of We combine uh, some of this information with some of the open source uh, information, for example, OpenStreetMap, uh, which is a database built by community of mappers everywhere in the world, which provide information about infrastructure, buildings, um, and is sometimes up to, more up to date than Google Maps. And it's because it's interactive, publicly owned. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of people continuously map first, continue upgrading it. So it's a valuable source of information to understand um, essentially the impact of this event. Uh, probably you will be happy to see finally something on Insta, but I will be quick here. And this is data we didn't process. Um, this is essentially uh, some colleagues from China uh, analyze it. Uh, the deformation pattern. I have to say, uh, I will be very careful in the interpretation. The coherence for such a dynamic environment is quite poor most of the time. But essentially, um, I provided also a link here uh, if you want to analyze by yourself. But essentially, these colleagues um, show that. Uh, from the time series of deformation that uh, the area was stable between 2019, 2020 until June 2020. And over the last few months, six months before the um, uh, explosive activity, we start to have some sign of instability with movements of up to six centimeters, displacement, sorry, uh, up to six centimeters. Um, and of course, such an information could be still important for emergency response and to understand if there are anomalies 
um, anomalous acceleration, which can uh, be a warning sign of an upcoming uh, explosion, for example. Then we, we analyze it also, not we, actually other people uh, involved in this um, uh, disaster charter response. Um, these again are colleagues from China. Uh, they focused on the NDVI. So uh, for each of the islands, they calculated the NDVI. Of course, we have to consider that sometimes could be tricky because some of the uh, buildings were not actually destroyed, uh, but just covered by hush. Okay, so NDVI was quite important to understand um, essentially which building were still in place, but uh, they look different in the optical image only because they were covered by ash. Um, but it also was as important, this is a before and after image, um, this is a profile section with the NDVI. You could see, of course, you still have a higher response um, over the island. Sorry, I have to probably tell NDVI is an uh, index user to understand the status of vegetation and health. The higher, the better. Uh, so when the island got covered, these are tropical and so huge vegetation. When it's covered by hash, you have a drop in the NDVI. We could see from 0.1 we start to have a minus 0 0.1, um, but was also useful not just for, okay, mapping the ash deposits over the islands, but also to, you could see here in the post event, to map some of the pumice raft surrounding the islands. Um, also because, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, like the, um, this volcano is um, uh, essentially, the submerged part is just the minimum amount of the whole edifice. So sometimes these pumice rafts are useful to uh, trace down the source, the main source of the event of any uh, volcanic activity. Then I'm putting here, again, this is uh, um, the information coming from the Copernicus Emergency Service. Um, these are ultimate uh, information. And these are information essentially recorded at tsunami waves. Um, it was quite lucky because this information come after this satellite have very coarse resolution compared to the radar optical satellite we are used to work. So we are talking about hundreds of meters to kilometers, but they have uh, daily revisiting time. So a few hours after the main explosion, uh, we could see these are the truck covering. And we can see we have put a sea level anomaly in the range of 20, 30 centimeters. Um, and uh, also, um, if we consider an anomaly, is the wave elevation of uh, one meter, uh, sli even slightly uh, larger than one meter. Uh, consider this the um, all the islands with habitants are located east of Tonga. So it, this is why we you see only the track on this side of the volcano. And now we, uh, let's start to see some of the image. This, uh, some of these information, of course, are already available to the disaster chart. As I say, everyone can access them. Um, um, as you can see, um, among the observation, these are from colleagues from China. Um, uh, there were people focusing on mapping the pumice raft, which are important, as I say, to understand the type of eruption, the size of it, uh, and also the main vent. Um, then we have also observation on the damage, and this is actually one of the official map you could see here. Uh, that are provided to hand user. Um, this is Tonga Tapu, the main island where the capital city sits. Um, we have limited damage. We still have huge hash coverage. As I said before, sometimes this hash coverage uh, is a problem because uh, doesn't help us in understanding which building has been destroyed, which actually, and which one is only been covered by ash.
we could um and you can see a before and after there were cases where a small vessel has been pushed ashore um and the analysis in the aftermath of the image uh, has been limited especially in tonga tapu as i said this activity disaster chart activity lasted essentially three weeks so in the space of three weeks there were not enough good image on tonga tapu um and all th this is um, a good example of template of uh, the data you can download from the disaster charter, where on the side you have the whole description about the background image, the data sources. So for example, all this building information, it was not mapped from these people, but they were taken from, taken from the OpenStreetMap database. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you see UNOSAT information from UNOSAT who was coordinating this response. This is the image from, uh, we start to see now a high resolution image um, in the southern part of um, the island. That is the same, I was showing you before the northern part. This is the southern part where this is key because this is the only international airport. So the only way to the criticality at that point was uh, to remove, you see, uh, all the inundated runaway, because it was the only way to provide uh, logistic support. Um, this, um, we start to move now to islands where we start to see a lot of damage. So we are literally just south, north of the main island, Tongatapu, we could see essentially three quarters of the building were wiped out. Also, this is the uh, aerial survey, which essentially showed that also trees have been appropriated. So uh, the other problem with a tsunami that essentially happened here a few hours after the main explosion is that this island has uh, essentially uh, only a few meters above the sea level. So. Uh, you can, the tsunami wind can completely cover um, the islands. So you could see here an insert of before and after. Um, this is Nomukam. This is not a false image color. This is again red, green, and blue. But you can see this island is completely uh, covered by hash. You start to see also clear tsunami trim line, which are key information we are working now, right now, to uh, constrain the tsunami model. Um, I'm start to move quicker so I can finish in time. This is again Nomuka, so it's a zoom, and you can see the before and after. Um, and uh, you can map the structural damage, the road damage, but also the shoreline. Um, this is Mango. Again, these are all small islands with local inhabitants. Um, these islands, the one I'm showing you, there is no, we have data for hundreds of islands, but this one I'm showing you is the one with the most damage. So you could see essentially almost all the buildings here were completely destroyed. This is nice because you could see the details of the image is so high that you can see also here, essentially temporary shelters erected on the island, higher area. Um, and this is, I will just move. So essentially we start to do this damage inventory, uh, how many buildings and roads were affected for the main islands, uh, taking also in consideration how far they are from the Unga Tonga, Unga Pai volcano. Um, and also we recorded tsunami observation. So as a BGS, we are mainly working on this side of the activity, as I say, the, there was a coordination, people working on inside, other on NDVI, other on the damage itself. We focusing on the tsunami trend lines. We have been doing this work also um, as a part of the Krakatau 2018 eruption. So we have quite a recent experience on that. We start recording the inundation elevation, the trim line extension, which are key uh, for uh, modeling the source of the tsunami. Um, and this is just an overview of uh, the damage as, uh, 
in a map, essentially. And you could see that uh, we have essentially islands uh, like Atatata, these in red, where we have essentially almost every building destroyed or severely uh, damaged, affected. And then the, um, there are uh, other islands between one and over 100 kilometers where the damage severity is much lower. Uh, this is just considering the percentage of building damage compared to the total number of buildings. Luckily, and surprisingly, Tunga Tapu, where essentially most, the majority of people lives, was slightly affected. And now we are working, now I'm talking now about the research activities or the science of, uh, side. So we have been receiving funding from NERC. Um, and we are working internationally to underpin activities needed to better understand what happened in January. Uh, so with uh, University of Auckland is collecting bathymetric survey, tsunami observation on the field. Uh, we couldn't go there because of COVID restriction mainly. Um, we as a BGS, COMET and BGS and University of Birmingham, we are working on the um, reconstructing, we are now projecting some high resolution satellite data to reconstruct the evolution of the volcano Hedifis before the January 2022 event. And we are also providing to University of Rhode Island information for modeling that tsunami. So, um, uh, we this all the trim lines saying in addition elevation, we are providing. Um, will help scientists in the US to model the tsunami because this information will be used as a evidence to constrain the model. And so this is my final slide, I promise. Essentially, I hope I show you how we, as a scientist and a heart observation scientist, we, provide, we use this data to provide scientific advice to government, but also to emergency responders. So is, I wanted to stress this was more to show you the impact in real life, not just the research side of things. But still, we are working now on the science question. Um, we can focus now on the science question, like the tsunami triggering mechanism was a submarine collapse, like in uh, uh, Krakatau, shock waves from the explosion itself, and also but this is something out of the let's say, um, activity we are doing right now. But just as a general question, what could be the long-term impact of this amount of ash sulfur um, in the atmosphere? And that was my last slides. So that's it. Rondo, Thanks. thank you so much. I think you have an in-person audience, so I hope they're giving you a, an applause as well. So there's one question in the question and answer box um, from Sergio Matias, who's asked, can you give a concrete example or story on how this project directly helped the local authorities? Yeah, so to do this, I will just go back uh, and share again. Um, so um, as this, for example, why was um, the real impact? We essentially when we start to map the damage, and this was an exercise where we have to do in one day, essentially, uh, we already could interact with the local emergency responders, essentially exclude a lot of areas. So as you can see, most of the damage was focused in few islands. So we can already say, okay, you have to prioritize this area. These are the, they are not, I mean, so badly affected. So even Tonga Tapu, where, of the 80,000 people living here, I think more than a half live here, but luckily in Tungatabu there was no much damage. So that was, I would say, probably the main, uh, let's say, benefit of this analysis that we could say, look, you just need to focus on Nomuka, Nomuka, Ike, Mango, Funoifua, Atata, that's it. That's the key um, in the aftermath. Yeah, cool. I, I... Sergio, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to put them in the chat, but I think that's that's really cool. Um, I'll keep going with the questions. I'll keep my own to myself for now. Um, an anonymous, anonymous attendee has asked, how long did it take you all to get the results okay. out of the images? Um, so, um, for example, in terms of, as I say, main explosion was 4 a.m. UTC time. 
in the afternoon, few, 12 hours later, for activated the charter. And uh, I would say consider that was a Saturday. That was also, let's say, the unlucky things of events. So essentially, in a few days by Tuesday, definitely we start to already upload on the, uh, you have all the uploading material date on the website. But essentially by Tuesday, you start to see the first damage map. Uh, and also uh, we as a Trimlines, we, yeah, we start uploading this information on a Tuesday, I think a few days after. Cool. So the event was on a Friday or Saturday. It was, it was a Saturday. Yeah. Um, I think it was a Saturday in the UK, Saturday afternoon. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Or Saturday morning. Uh, cool. Did you have to come into work? I know I said I wouldn't ask. Uh, no. Uh, me personally, no. Uh, I don't think any of BGS uh, did it. Uh, but probably it would have happened on a Friday, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, um, the other things, uh, sorry, the, um, as I say, the priority, talking about this, when you have to consider these results are continuously updated. You have also sometimes you end up for the disaster charter having different group working on the same area, on the same aspect. Um, sometimes there is no time for the project manager to coordinate effectively. Uh, the different group working. Also, you might have also people who not directly involved in the disaster charter who wants to provide their own contribution. So they provide the data set they have. So it's a continuous evolving. So some of these information, they are updated the day after. Um, yeah, that's it. Cool. cool. Um, I will, we've got a few other questions. So, sorry. So, we'll go to Alex's question in a second. But Drew has asked, uh, hello, very interesting presentation. I'm wondering, was the inside data useful in predicting unrest or eruption, or was it something that was analyzed in retrospect? Sorry. Was something, and that, this is unfortunate because there are a lot of group working on trying to predict uh, or uh, depict anomalous motion. But as most of the time, still, even for Krakatau, it's a retrospective analysis. So um, we, as a PGS, we have not been involved directly in the inside data. The, the slider user was from colleagues from China. But of course, this is all important evidence that we can build on to finally try to really use inside data to predict or at least uh, highlight a dangerous situation associated with volcanic activities. Um, but um, yeah, at the moment, the, the answer is just a retrospective analysis. So, for example, the inside data, just considering also the, uh, the, uh, the question from before was the latest to be delivered. Because, as I say, the main key for the charter, uh, we are not talking about science here, was the damage. And um, I don't know, Tamara, if you read already, there is another question about Alex Jenkins. Yes, yes, yeah, so yes, that's I, the one that I read earlier, okay. but if you want to answer that one now. that Yeah, so um, essentially, uh, I will read just for the recordings. Huh? Um, what is the timeline takes to obtain the assessment of damage, number of buildings, runaway impact relative to the response time required for resource and such? Uh, consider that um, the damage assessments uh, arrived already. As I told you, we as a BGS, we start to provide the first results on a Tuesday, I think, Monday, Tuesday, so a few days after. But I think on a Sunday, there were people in that disaster charter activation already providing information. So it was literally just the, um, uh, sometimes could be a question of, I would say, 48 hours to get the first um results and of course it's still important because it's not real time but still you have to consider that for the um, type of setting where you have hundreds of islands even just 10 with inhabitants okay uh but still 48 hours could still be a lot to direct uh local support because in 48 hours um i, I don't think you can cover uh, provide in, literally uh, emergency, uh, I don't know, food or everything to 10 islands 
in the middle of the Pacific during an ongoing eruption. So, yeah, I would say that even this 48 hours, two, three days is still enough time to for um, response time, essentially, for people who will actually go on the field in such settings. I wonder as follow-up, um, we don't have any active questions, but feel free to put them in chat. But I wonder as a quick follow-up, um, do you know if there were any major lessons learned from this event for future? Uh -huh. I, I mean, it's um, definitely sometimes um, one of the, for example, during the Krakatau, uh, we were involved with, with the disaster charter um, for the Palo, for example, earthquake and tsunami. At that time, um, we have to, even with the charter, we have access to the data, but we still have to download them. So that was usually a waste of time. Let's say it's, so even this direction, the charter has taken to allowing the processing on the fly of the data, that's its key. I think the main thing is having a unique platform though, where everyone can share the information and the others can see. Because as I say, sometimes you end up having different group working on the same things independently. So it's, uh, let's say, a duplication of efforts. Uh, so having this sort of, but of course, it's something you learn in time. As I say, there were only few activation in 20, 2001. Now you have 40, 50. That's the account. So you, the more activation you have, the more you learn. So I think it's this sort of coordination is the key um, to where everyone can access uh, with the other groups the data. That's for me. Uh, a key, uh, let's say, breakthrough in the disaster activity response. Yeah, cool. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think we're just about on five o'clock and we don't have any active questions. So I think that's a pretty good time to say thank you <laughs> and call it there.